Welcome, everybody. My name is Jack Chen. I'm the director of the Price Institute. We're sponsoring this event. I'm really so glad we can be together with this uh, together in safety. Uh, I hope you're all doing well and um, staying out of harm's way. I know it's a very difficult time uh, for all of us and especially for those of us in the tri-state region where the pandemic and the badly mangled management of the pandemic on the federal level uh, hopefully we'll start changing and hopefully start getting better. But in the meantime, I'm hoping you're all staying very safe and being well and um, taking care of yourself and your loved ones. Uh, we're really delighted to be able to sponsor this event, uh, Healing Movement, Dancing from Trauma to Healing. And uh, and it's, it's really an event uh, that uh, I think all of us intuitively know, our bodies know what this means, but sadly, I think on the societal level, there hasn't been a lot of acknowledgement of, of, of what this is about. And part of why I'm speaking is really going back to the foundational injustices that happened in North America in which people in our region, especially in the tri-state region were dispossessed now I'm talking about especially the Muncie Lenape who are in the immediate Rutgers Newark area, north of the Raritan River and dispossessed from their lands, from their medicines, from their foods, from the way, the, the, the way in which they had connected to the lands and waters for thousands of years. So it meant really a whole way of life being forced and ended very, very quickly. And of course, we tend to think of that as maybe disconnected from enslavement and slavery. But in fact, those same large parcels of land, let's say half a million acres of land that became the Elizabeth patent were then turned into plantations. And these plantations were then supplying the foodstuffs for the plantations in the Caribbean. So we're talking about a, a, a deep system that once the United States formed, actually it built on top of that system that had already been established. So when we're looking at questions of dispossession and enslavement, we're talking about hundreds and hundreds of years, generations after generation of people who have been impacted by those policies. And those policies have continued to uh, impact on the bodies of those very same people. Those who have survived passing on the unresolved injustices from generation to generation. I think those of us who know about Holocaust studies are familiar with the term about, uh, that's called post memory, in which oftentimes the sons and daughters of those who survived the Holocaust still carry the unresolved issues from the Holocaust itself, the Jewish Holocaust, the Nazi Holocaust, the death camps. And we tend not to acknowledge the colonial consequences of, of, uh, of events and dispossession and enslavement that happened so many hundreds of years ago. But it stands to reason and stands to our knowing that that has had an impact. So today is really a fantastic chance to be in dialogue with dancers because dancers of all people know their bodies so well. Their bodies uh, are in tune with all the issues that we're talking about. But we tend not to think of dance that way. We tend to think of dance as a performance, a spectator sport in which you enjoy it or you perform it. But in fact, all movement and all dance uh, and you know, implicate our bodies and what our bodies can't do and refuse to do. So our bodies know the difference and our bodies carry that um, generational memory and the generations of trauma and unresolved issues. So it's really our, uh, our, our, our honor to be working with these dancers today uh, and to be coming together in this way to talk about something that of course is about joy and pleasure and movement. And it's also about these very difficult issues uh, that we're hoping to also tackle together. Uh, I just wanted to say uh, thank you for all the dancers who have so generously agreed to be with us. Thank you so much for Rosamond King, um, who you'll be introduced to in a minute uh, for, uh, for leading this discussion. And I also wanna especially acknowledge um, the work of uh, 
Marissa Pearson, who has been organizing the dance program uh, for the Price Institute for 15 years and plus. So Marissa, thank you. I'm really, we, we're really indebted to the work you've done. And we're so sorry that we can't actually be doing this in, in person with dancers on a stage. Uh, but we love you, Marissa. Thank you so much. Uh, so without any further delay, I, it's my honor to introduce Rosamond King, uh, a friend and colleague who's at Brooklyn College. Thank you, Jack, for opening up the space and for acknowledging the land. I want everyone to know that this event is being recorded and it will be shared online in a few days via the Price Institute website. While I'm introducing our first speaker, Camille King, I invite you to write into the chat where you are and what your relationship is to movement and dance. I am on Canarsie land, not far from an African burial ground in a place that is also known as Bedford-Stuyvesant or do or die Bed-Stuy, Brooklyn. Um, I'm a performance artist and I grew up dancing in formal settings as well as in living rooms, really watching the grown-ups dance to people like Miriam McCabe and John Coltrane and Sparrow. And I know a lot of you have your, have your video on mute and that's totally fine, but because we're talking about bodies and many of us come from embodied cultures, we also encourage you to have your video on um, throughout, the, throughout the event or to come in and out of video as you feel like it. And if there are children and elders there, that's fine. And if you're like me and you fidget a little bit, that's fine too. We'd also love to have your reactions in real time, whether that's kind of leaning in or doing a motion or giving us the, the virtual reactions or whether it's writing a question or a comment into the chat. So we were really looking forward to having a conversation with you and our speakers are going to um, share their, their knowledge with you. And we might go a little bit over time because we have all these wonderful people to fit in in one hour. So the person who we're going to begin with is based where Rutgers is in New Jersey. Camille King is an educator, a choreographer, an arts liaison, and artist, assistant artistic director of Usama Dance Company, as well as a director of the Montclair High School Dance Company. Originally from New Jersey, Camille began her dance training at the age of 11. After many years of being a teaching artist and a dance teacher in New Jersey, she is now a fully certified Newark public school teacher employed at Speedway Academies. She sees herself as a crafter and creator of movement, an educator and advocate for the arts in education and a believer in the power of dance. Please welcome Camille King. Thank you, thank you so much. So I just wanna start off um, before we get started into my presentation, I just want to start off by saying that I'm currently teaching at East Orange Campus High School, um, where I founded, don't worry, I just want to, don't worry. <laughs> so I was a teacher in Newark for a very long time, for, for a couple of years. Um, and then I later, I'm now, um, I founded a program at East Orange Campus High School. That's where I'm currently working. Um, it is similar to Newark, East Orange. It's in an inner city. It is a city um, located in New Jersey, directly next to any of the oranges. It's part of the oranges. So I just want to um, start off by saying that this um, presentation is based on my experience, my lived experience, and it should not be um, taken as a representation of all, everybody who represents or identifies as being Black and female, because we know that um, all of our experiences are very fluid, they're very different, and it's, um, we just don't want to, we want to make sure that we don't lump all of those things together. So this is art as portal, body as keeper. Next slide, thank you. So I want you to know that this is going to be an offering from myself to you. Um, this presentation is basically going to unpack um, embodied resilience, the body as a tool for healing in regards to trauma, racial trauma, and most of all, just specific lived experiences from my own experience as a artist of color, um, a female who has been in many cross-cultural spaces where my body is typically othered because of my body and because of the body that I occupy. Um, and that is it. Thank you. Next slide. So body as keeper, this image right here is from a piece that I just, I recently just graduated from um, Hollins University 2019 for my master's. And so I'm very excited about that. And this piece was a piece that I did entitled um, South Clinton Street Dreamin'. And it was a piece that 
um, was myself embodying the gender performance of an African-American male, um, adolescent male. And so I'm going to start going through a couple of things. So the first thing is body as keeper. And I just have a couple of bullet points here. This is just offerings for you. So embody generational trauma, ancestral trauma in, in informing our lived experiences, body as keeper and holder of knowledge and embodied survival as a tool of resilience. So when I'm thinking about my body as a keeper or a holder of knowledge, I am thinking about the lived experiences that my body holds, but I'm not only my lived experiences, but the lived experiences from my ancestors. So when I say this, I mean that my grandmother had a, a ton of trauma. She was a African-American woman growing up in the South, migrating to the North. Her body is filled with all kinds of knowledges um, and trauma. That trauma and knowledge was then passed down and informed the way she raised my mother. And that, that those knowledges and experiences then formed and informed the way that my mother raised myself and my, and my brother. And a lot of those experiences were, and lessons and teachings were about survival. Um, so all of this knowledge that was passed down from my grandmother to my mother to myself and my brother, they were mostly about survival. Um, and when I say survival, um, I'm talking about surviving one's space, surviving one's location, time, violence, bigotry, misogyny, systematic structures that are placed um, maybe onto one's body or in one space that prevents them from move, moving forward as a human in this world. Next slide. So what informs my practice and my work, my art, everything that I do? Um, I want you to go to the next slide. And I just provided just a couple of things. Next slide, please. And I'm not going to read them all, but these are all the things that when I'm creating work, these are all the things that I am thinking about when I'm placing my body into work, my feeling into work, my mind into work. These are all of the things that are incorporated in me. Next slide. So art as portal. When I'm thinking about a portal, I'm defining portal and the Google definition of portal is an entryway, this entrance, this gateway. Um, and art for me is serving as this connection portal, connecting my trauma to my healing. So just if you can just take that in. So art for me is connecting my trauma to my healing. Art is a tool for me to conceptualize the process of not only identifying my trauma, but also identifying my healing and my movement practices. Um, I just want to, my mentor, Karen Love, um, she, pre-COVID, like many artists, I, we were commissioned to do a work at South Orange um, Theater, it's called SOPAC, and I asked her uh, how she thought this, her, our new work was going to live in our performance space, and recently we both um, experienced two major deaths in our lives, um, my grandmother and her brother. Um, and she just said, I want this work to exist as a portal. And when she said that, I was instantly um, hit uh, with all of these emotions and thinking about what a portal means to me. And I instantly began to think about this idea of portal um, as this shifting through experiences. So shifting through lived, the lived and the unknown, shifting through the imagined future and the past shifting through the then and the now, shifting through my trauma in search of my healing. Next slide. This is another representation of uh, South Clinton Street Dreamin'. And this is, this is me shifting through experience. Um, it is me shifting through the trauma, the imagined trauma, because I am not an African-American male. Um, this is me shifting through the imagined trauma of the African-American males that I teach in my own current spaces currently right now. Next slide. So here is where we get to the offerings, my offering, body as vessel, embodied survival as a tool of resilience, embodied resilience as a tool for hope, embodied art as a tool for action, and embodied practices and body as collaborator, being in collaboration with my body. If I think about my body and you think about your body as not only a vessel of trauma, 
but also a vessel for healing, then you know that this body is a container. It is a container for not only your trauma, but also your healing. And oftentimes we just think about um, the trauma that we hold in our bodies. And sometimes we forget that we also have tools that were generationally passed down to us that are resilient, that represent this, um, this ability to move forward. And sometimes we, we don't have that and that is also okay. I just wanna make sure we are aware of that as well. Next slide, please. Um, I just want to offer these final things to my viewers um, and the viewers who are on this panel, to all of the movers, lovers of dance, art, creators, um, and creating, the teachers, the crafters, the youth, and the parents and the guardians, but also the dancers. Um, there is power in movement and the organization of bodies and sound. Listen to what your body may need create a movement practice. I love what Rosamond said about sometimes dancing at home, dancing with your family, that is a movement practice. Practice stillness and hold space and connect with your community. Thank you, next slide. of that video are myself, Camille King, Demetrius Burns, and the videographer of that video is Andrea Young. I thank you. I thank the panelists. I thank Rutgers and the Price Institute. Thank you so much. Thank you, Camille, for your offerings. Um, we appreciate them, and I know we're going to come back to them. Our next presenter is Nigel Whitson who is bi-coastal between New York and LA, where they are an assistant professor in the UC Riverside, University of California Riverside Dance Department. Nyjah is a queer, non-binary, trans, multidisciplinary artist, a creative capital and two-time Bessie awardee, and a wound and word worker referred to as majestic by the New York Times. They engage transdisciplinarity through a critical intersection of the sacred and conceptual in black, queer, and trans embodiedness, sight, science, body, and spirit. They are the recipient of many awards, including being a current artist in residence at 18th Street in LA and at New York Live Feed. Whitson is a sought after speaker, presenter, and conversationalist. So we are so pleased to have them with us here today. Please welcome Nigel Whitson.
I'm getting ready. Looking above into a volume. This black trans body and this body embodied resilience is black joy. I'm going to give you some recipes. Expose your skin. Braid the tiny hairs on the back of your neck with the air. Mm -hmm. Surrender to the way the room touches you. If necessary, teach it how to be with your body. Find your hands. Remember your mother's, 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 mother's way of plucking weeds for mending, tending to things. See her in meadows or tossing herbs into a volcano, making medicine with ash, breathe in the smoke. Clock your fingers until they are wands. Now put your wands on your skin. Number two, rose. Rooibos. Mother Wood. Three. Room. Rosemary. Black salt. Four, a shaman call. I think about joy. Black joy. Because baby shares encouraged us to love our flesh, to love it all. Because loving black flesh is the pride. I prefer perform joy, black joy, because in its ongoing practice, I discovered it as the resource, the well from which to draw strength. I write about joy, black joy, because we are not supposed to have it. Because the incessant nature of anti-black racism is supposed to interdict and inhibit the very possibility for five. Make this and pound them. Be wild with your hips. Sit. Piss somebody off. Twerk. Look a lollipop. Seven. Cut it off. Cut it out. Eight. Mm -hmm. Look up. Thank you so much, Nija, for that offering and for bringing ritual into the space and movement.
We, we have a lot of richness today. I'm so, I'm so excited to be here with you. I'm moderating this panel because I wanted to be in the midst of it. So thank you. Born in Auckland, Uteroa, Jack Gray is an internationally recognized Maori contemporary dancer, choreographer, teacher, facilitator, and writer. He is a founding member and now artistic director of Atamira Dance Company. Gray's independent art practice spans two decades and has taken him all over the world where he engages with diverse audiences in community-centered spaces of indigenous knowledge exchange. He's also widely published. Jack creatively devises indigenous approaches towards enhanced relationships between place, people, and potential. Please welcome Jack Gray. Tēnā kata katoa, he mihi nui i tēnei wā um, ko Ngāti Parauraua, ko Te Rarawa Takuiwi, uh, ko Tamaki Makaurau Ahau, uh, no Aotearoa hoki, ko Jack Gray tāku ingoa, uh, kei te mihi nui ki te mana whenua o Lenape Hawking, no reira tēnā kata katoa. Hi everyone, my name is Jack Gray and I come from Aotearoa. Um, Rosemond, that was really great pronunciation by the, by the way. And um, yeah, I'm, I'm really pleased to be here. I want to acknowledge Jack Chen for the invitation to be here and also a previous um, relationship we've had um, at the APA Institute at NYU, which is where um, a lot of the work of connecting threads um, across realms, spaces, territories and peoples through the body um, has really kind of taken shape. So we're going to start with a video, um, just a couple of snippets of some ideas. Thank you. As this dance continues, I want you to allow the walls of your room or the fences of your garden or whatever boundaries physical you have around you to slowly fade away. I want you to even realize that we can move past these boxes that we're in digitally. We're not in these boxes. Our energy is beyond. Te ao marama, the world of light. Um, those snippets were, I guess, just some video captures of workshopping. And um, I guess one of the things I want to really acknowledge is sponta spontaneity and the importance of uh, where we begin from. Um, this image here that you're looking at is the beginning of a production of a work that I made around uh, my homeland of Mitimiti, which is uh, my tribal ancestral area, about five hours away out of Auckland, where I was raised in the city. And, and I was really interested in how we return, how we regather and how we begin. And so the beginning of Movement for Joy um, in any context or any shape is all about waiting and holding and connecting to breath and body. Um, this image here is a sort of an image of the whareinui that I um, whakapapa to. So the whareinui is our ancestral home. 
and the whakapapa is the lineage that we come from, but it also means the stitching together of lands, places, stories, ancestors, peoples, and traversing through oceans that are held in recitatory um, memory um, through the body. So the ancestral house of the body and of our, um, of our own bodies are, are the meeting places and the spaces in which I think that um, we have opportunities as peoples in rooms gathered for purposes of sharing space and time can, uh, can begin the work. Um, these images here are looking at uh, people in the digital space who have dispersed around the world and have connection to Miti Miti as a concept of how the place where I come from is, is is a placeholder for many places that we all come from, our roots, our ancestors, our lineages before. And so I invited people, my, my, my intention is always to invite people into the conversations around how we connect and, and, and how our embodiment is disembodied, displaced, but also has the ability to come together in, in various ways. And I think whether it's digitally or physically, and of course we're navigating that in the world at this present moment, um, there, there is some sense where we can find the purity and the pleasure and the joy of each other's company and, and, and our connections and relationships to space and place. Uh, I love to um, gather people and um, I find that people are more than willing to, to be in spaces that are nourishing and activated and sacred in many ways. And, I have really appreciated my time in whenever I was in Turtle Island and in the United States because I found that, um, you know, there is a deep resonance with trauma and with the wounds of the past. I think that um, those emotions that are shared and the pain that is very visceral and very felt um, is something quite igniting and something quite powerful. Um, as a space to think, as a space to discuss, as a space to contemplate, as a space to share. Um, this image here was taken in New York just before, um, yeah, things locked down and, and, and we went into the first quarantine this year. Um, and my intention really was to continue to um, connect the, the embers of various times that I'd been in New York City in, in Manahata, in Lenape Hooking, and just this reminder that, you know, we uh, are guardians and kaitiaki of, of the stories and of the peoples and of the fires that are burning. And so um, I always like to return to places. Um, the place where I come from, Miti Miti, is also known as um, Hukianga Whakapau Karakia, which means the place of exhausted prayers, but it's also a place of return. And uh, con consistently arriving and returning all at the same time. This image here is of two dancers who come from this land. The dancers in Atameda Dance Company, which is the leading Māori contemporary dance company in, in New Zealand, which is um, one of the, the company that I was a founding member of 20, 20 years ago and currently the artistic director. Um, I, I suppose the thing is, is that a lot of people find dancing after when they leave the place that they come from. But I, I'm always interested in what it is that when we find our embodied experiences, how can we return that back to the places that have nurtured, nourished us and grown us and how do our um, intentions kind of map and weave. So I guess to finish, it's been a really quick eight minutes. I can't believe it's over already. Um, and, and I put this on purpose. It says, breathe in, breathe out, repeat. And I, I really think, you know, we are in conversation with the ancestral realm uh, and that the life force principle, Modi or the breath um, is the energy that keeps us in the space. And I think it's a space of great potential, a space of great opportunity. And so movement for joy can arrive from that space when, we, when we're rooted, when we're grounded. So just to finish, maybe I can ask everyone to take an inhalation with me and an ex exhalation out. Kia ora. Puha Pungi Puha One more Pungi Puha
Tenakata Katoa. Thank you. Thank you so much, Jack, for your activation of our space and for the breath. Our final speaker before we go into our conversation is Nicole Stanton. Nicole Stanton is a dance artist and educator and provost and senior vice president for academic affairs at Wesleyan University. Through choreography and performance, she explores the intersections between personal, cultural, political, and physical experiences with an eye towards celebrating the complexities of Black cultures and creating platforms that cultivate community. The recipient of several awards, grants, and residencies, her artistic practice emphasizes collaboration, and she considers her creative research, which she calls Dancing at the Crossroads, to be a constellation of embodied and liberatory practices. Please welcome Nicole Stanton. Hello, and thank you everyone for being here to all the panelists. This is an amazing opportunity to be in this portal, to be in this activated space. This to me is a, a very healing uh, experience and I'm delighted and honored to be here with you all today, at least digitally in the space. Um, and so I'm gonna talk just a little bit about a project that I've been working on called Storied Places. And the Storied Places project really I think typifies my ideas about collaboration and how we work together to both embody resilience and to envision new futures. Story Places explores the experience of migration. It explores the way the places that we move through and in, how they hold our stories, how they keep our stories, how they transform our stories. But also it's a process, it's been a process of self-defining new possibilities. The project really drew its inspiration from some specific spaces in the world from places in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, where I'm originally, I'm originally from, Homewood, the Hill District and Garfield, as well as New York City, Harlem in specific. We drew on the idea of the great migration of African-Americans from the rural South to urban centers in the Midwest and the, and the Northeast Coast. But we've also, oops, sorry about that. Uh, but we also wanted to think about this, not just as looking back, but as looking forward. I was very inspired by the work of artists in Afrofuturism because it's been my experience that a lot of black cultural practices get framed around the past. And so it's always in history. It's something that is about what came before. And so I got really interested in this idea as a healing practice of thinking of a fluid approach to time, a way of moving forward and back to envision new possibilities and to embody new futures. Each time, this is an, it's been an iterative process and I've worked with a number of musicians, poets, performers of all sorts. And each time we come back to the piece, it's really grounded in their stories as well as mine. My process, the way I work as a choreographer is not about inviting other bodies to be my body, but it really is about trying to decenter a single voice and create a space where multiple voices, multiple bodies and multiple stories can exist and thrive in community. And it's in this way that I think we move through trauma, we move towards new stories, new energies, and new visions as we weave together our experiences. So what I'm gonna share with you now is just a short video. It's a clip and a series, it time travels in its own way of different iterations of this piece. So video please. This first part, its scenes and dialogue will be inspired by the need to go. Matters of flight push and pull this direction and that. The flight, the flight, paper airplane, paper airplane, gazing functions as an anchor or as a fulcrum for believing 
and the gun. Head, like a halo, thick soled shoes. The telling parts of storied places. <laughs> Rotating suggests that time, as we might imagine it in this Western world, is all around us. East to west, south to north. No vote, no place, no food, no job, no house, no room. No green, no peace, no quiet, no way further in, no way on out, no way to turn around, no peace, no quiet, no, 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 no. How do you spell north? N O. Why would you stop there? Why do you think you can do anything but stop there? How do you spell your name? N O. Tell me why you stopped there. We were halted, redirected. Now you spell north for me. Thank you. Thank you for the time to, to share the work with you. And I just want to acknowledge the performers that you saw. The All the music was originally composed by Jay Hogard. And the vocalist that you saw is DK Dyson. The performers you saw were Sydney Liggett, Kelly Lynch, Annie King, Dante Brown, myself, <laughs> uh, and then in the uh, original slide, you also saw Joya Powell. Uh, you saw Candace, Candace Green, and you saw Melanie Green. Thank you. Thanks so much. 
Thank you so much, Nicole. And thank you to all of our speakers. I have good news. Um, we can stay about 15 minutes later so we can have a little bit more of a rich discussion. Um, I'm gonna encourage you to take a moment, breathe, stretch, shake, do whatever you want, and then put your comments and questions in the chat. What I'm gonna do is read through some of the just bursts of language that I took from everyone and then I'm going to take the, the prerogative of asking the first question. Body as keeper, as vessel, art as portal. Joy, embodied resilience as well as embodied trauma. Be wild. Moments of looking and not looking. Where do we begin from? And how do we return? Ancestral house of the body arriving and returning, great potential. Stories, self-defining new possibilities. No peace, no quiet. You've got a right. Yes, ancestors and mothers and grandmothers. So that's some of what I pulled from everybody without giving kind of a narrative <laughs> summary of what you all so beautifully and brilliantly did. Um, and the first thing I wanna do is, is acknowledge one of the gifts that I think all of the speakers and presenters have given to us is that even though this is, a, this is an event about mo healing movement and healing from trauma, that no one led with trauma. Right, everyone was leading with joy and resilience and life and breath. And I thought that that in and of itself was extremely useful. All of you have been doing this work for a very long time, right? You've been engaging healing and movement, living through trauma for an extremely long time. And my first question is, has anything about your healing movement practice changed or shifted since either March or since there has been more global attention to police murders, both here in the United States and in many of the other countries that folks are coming in from, from Australia, Canada, France, et cetera. Yes, <laughs> I'll, I'll jump in. Uh, and also just want to thank everyone since I didn't get to do that um, audibly earlier and to speak that the four performers in that first clip you saw were Kirsten Davis, Paloma McGregor, um, Shayla V. Jenkins and myself. And ha um, how or has anything about the practice shifted? I, everything about it has, has shifted, not everything, most things. Um, I have embraced the significance of quietude and of, of stillness. Not that I was uh, averse at all to it, but, the, but the, the real gift and I think the, the ancestral teaching of, of, of stoppage um, uh, and the, the, the need to really, really listen um, has been been significant. I've also turned a lot to my herbal medicine practice and being in a, an exchange and gift, that's what all this is behind me, um, of exchanging with folks and being available and ready um, to have like other kinds of tangible offerings that also are for me a conversation with my body and the earth, um, body and ritual, body and indigenous knowledge. Um, so, so I have kind of, I've quieted and really leaned in uh, and the result has also been a lot of space making. So the things that were taking, making a lot of noise and taking up space um, extraneously have, have melted in a way. Anyone else want to jump in? Otherwise, I'll take another question about how your practice has changed. I'll, I'll, I'll jump in actually just a, a, a little bit because, you know, it's actually really been a challenge for me. I spend a lot of time in these kinds of digital spaces. And so figuring out how to have that real, that time that Nigel was just talking about to to sort of listen to slow down to experience to think about m my perceptions as more than just the visual I joke about 
wanting the opportunity to use my peripheral vision as opposed to just seeing in front. So just really trying to find ways to feel my whole self, the opportunity just to spiral at some points has become really significant for me. And so something I'm really valuing just about uh, being here is really that opportunity to hear how all of you all are doing this work and keep doing this work in this really um, challenging environment. I would like to offer something as well. Um, I, in the beginning of the quarantine, I was feeling very dislocated. Um, it is only an, maybe about a month ago that did I feel that my roots were finally connected to my foundation because oftentimes I felt as if I was floating. Um, and many, much of my projects, I had to reimagine the way that they could exist in the world. And that is sometimes difficult. When you have a plan, your plan is flipped on its head and now you have to reimagine the way that it can live. Um, and I'm still working on that, so. <laughs> Jack, would you like to add or shall I go to the next question? Next question, all right. I'm gonna take, I'm gonna share two questions that are related. Um, the first is how can we use dance to help heal from trauma individually, in family and in community? And the related question is that all of you are in various ways educators and I'm an educator and traditionally this program has uh, attracted a lot of educators, not necessarily dance educators, but people who are educating children, youth, and adults. And uh, Jack asks, how might embodied knowledge become the core of what schools, including colleges, study, research, and produce in all facets of what we do? Hello, everyone. Um, I guess I just wanted to acknowledge um, the idea that movement can be for everybody and, um, and how important that is in sort of resurrecting um, resilient communities and um, ways in which our core um, connection can be experienced and therefore our identities can be in a fluid state of transformation. Um, and one of the aspects for me in Movement for Joy is that it was all about partnership with the art center that I work at, um, Corbin Estate Art Center where we were based and realizing that as a group of incredible artists, we're, we're, we're producing amazing work all separately and quite individually in the same site. And I had um, had a vacation in Rarotonga in the Cook Islands and I was really struck by the idea that um, that island feels like a home that is owned by all the peoples of that place. So they witness you, they greet you, just, you know, this idea of random strangers, like connecting with you and knowing that you're not from there because they know everyone on that tiny island. And, and I really love that feeling of relationship. And I, and I know that for, as being in the dance community and being in different types of productions where you just kind of release a bit of separation between yourself and other people in order to come into some type of uh, communion of energy and um, ideas. And so I wanted to replicate that feeling of openness that you would feel in your home. And, and as such, uh, what it did was dismantle the ideas around the dance studio as a specific site for specific people doing specific things. And oftentimes people don't feel able to come into that space, into an empty room and to feel adequate and to feel like they can fill up that space. And um, one of the beautiful things is I love to promote the idea that the space is the people. So who, so one of the, um, I guess the traditions of the class is that we take a photo at the end and then we put that on Facebook. And then what happens is people see so many different types of faces, children, babies, mothers, um, all types of people. And then that starts to break the barriers down. And I'm, I'm, I'm an artistic director of a, a, a nationally funded dance company with very specific aims, goals, 
and expectations and very high level achievement um, that we want to do. But there's a part of me that feels like I wanna make other spaces available um, where I can learn from, from all types of bodies and all types of beings. So um, how we slide between those spaces. And then I've often found just one last thing, I've often found that um, people who are new to the process of thinking and being in their bodies in a, in a particular way have often the most interesting insights than people who have been practicing for a long time and are sort of searching for something. But, but when people discover something, that's powerful. Are there any other thoughts about bringing embodied, embodied knowledge, embodied movement into education? And I'm also going to encourage, I wanna acknowledge that um, of the 60 something people who are in this Zoom room, there's an incredible amount of wisdom and knowledge. So you can feel free to also answer the questions in the chat because I know that there's a, a lot of educators who have joined us today and who in your own practices are doing this work as well. I'll offer something just following up on the idea of how do you bring uh, embodied experience into the core of uh, an educational mission of any kind of institution, whether or not it's focused on dance or not. And so uh, for, for my, in my experience, actually, I think working at Wesley, and this is something that we do practice quite a bit, and it comes through collaboration. It comes through working closely with uh, artists and scholars and all different kinds of disciplines, having an opportunity to really to sort of think about research uh, and that movement and the moving body, the moving self is part of, a, is, a, is a research practice in some ways. And being able to have those conversations, say that we're, we're looking at an idea or a concept and we bring all of our different methodological lenses to that question. And then we enter into the space that way and we share and learn and expand in that way. And I feel like that can be a, a really rich, so it's kind of topical. What are we thinking about and what are the tools? What are the processes? What are the methods that we need to, to explore that and movement, movement making, the creative practice is one of those methods. At least that's kind of my experience. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I would like to offer something as well. One thing that I would like to challenge and dismantle um, that I see often in many spaces of academia is this idea of technique. Um, this idea that sometimes separates um, the dancer who has been training all of her life or all of his life from the person and training in a studio space. When I say training, I mean training in a studio space or in a classroom space versus someone who has this embodied knowledge where they are moving with friends and family and that aspect of their life is not considered technique. It is not considered something that is valuable. So oftentimes when we think about technique, it needs to have an S at the end of it, techniques, instead of it being something that's singular, something that's othering. Um, because when we do this, it allows for other voices to enter into that studio space, the dance space, wherever that is, and exist as a human, as someone who has something to offer, um, someone who has a voice. So I think for my educators who are in the room, um, if you are thinking about that, also this idea of allowing your students to sometimes, like Nicole said, contribute to your space. How, how are you contributing to your space, but how can my students contribute to my space as well? It doesn't all, only have to be me offering my, my knowledge. It could also be them offering something as well. I, I wanna thank you. Thank you for that, all of you. Um, I'm looking down at notes, so I'm not <laughs> staring off into a phone. Um, I think about the intentionality right now. So I'm coming from an African diasporic context, particularly Yoruba cosmology. So just to, to name that I'm thinking of this through a particular lens, but, but healing happens when there's intention for it. And also important for us to not think about healing as this as an act that that occurs in one direction um, or that occurs and, and fixes, but that that healing 
in quotations, is, is, a, is a process. So in order for that thing to be activated, it is a, um, I think it has to be an acknowledgement of uh, a relationship to time, right? And Nicole's work thinking about that, but that there isn't, it's not like an instantaneous act that does the work, but that it is a, a living into. So the, the re bringing in an embodied practice into our various fields is about not that one gesture of bringing in a movement person for the one class, right? Or uh, for the one workshop, but that, um, we radicalize our just relationships to tools. And right? so for folks who are in other kinds of fields of, instead of thinking of, of uh, for people in the sciences of just all of your, uh, all of the of equipment as a thing for which uh, we are served, but that it has a history, it is connected to material, that material is connected to land. Uh, those things were fortified, mined, um, exploited even by by people right who are those who are those folks but that there are even if we are imagining for ourselves that everything that we we touch is connected to to all of the above right to to history to place to people um then it also will, will challenge our relationships to uh capitalism which disembodies all of us um it's a part of how it functions but for me, it's, it's it's kind of like this this holistic way of considering that um, a, a healing process, an embodied process, is 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 life um, focused, affirmed, um, and designed. Thank you. You know, and I know that we have um, at least one science teacher who's been who's been posting in the chat. I do not teach dance, and I've been teaching remotely. And there's something very simple that I've been having. I've been encouraging my students regularly to do, which is to stand up. And it's like, <laughs> just and I'm just like, you can stand up during class. It's fine. And so their posture sometimes changes. You know, their whole relationship to an attention sometimes to the class can change. So very simple things can also be incorporated into what we mean when we talk about embodiment in education. I wanted to ask a question inspired by everybody's presentations. You know, when we think about dance, when we think about movement, we typically think about the, the limits for better or worse of the human body. And so I'd love for you to talk a little bit about the, non-human tangible. So I'm thinking, um, Nyjah, for instance, about some of the ritual that you brought in, the elements. I'm thinking about the non-physical in terms of sound, Nicole, for instance, that you brought in. I'm also thinking about ancestors. I'm thinking about the non-human um, uh, relatives that we have, how, how other aspects beyond kind of what we traditionally think of as the human body come into your practices of healing movement. Uh, I can say briefly because it it feels just easy that it's it's everything. Uh, it is the center. It is the foundation. Um, I have a, a shrine behind me. My mom was on it. Um, I don't, you know, a part of my use of they them pronouns is to acknowledge that I walk with people. Um, so when my pronouns are invoked, when my name is invoked, so are my folks, so are my warriors, so are my ancestors. So it, it is, it is, it is everywhere. It is at the door of my work. Um, and I think that also just speaking to, to how we, uh, seek to, to heal through, uh, through movement that it is to literally move with, with our people. I'll offer something just around the idea of kind of, uh, moving with, moving through, uh, and, and thinking of performance practice as just deeply and inherently interdisciplinary. So it's all moving in its own way. The voice, when you sing, when you speak, your, your throat is dancing in some way. Uh, when you, the space is designed in some way, the space is dancing with you. And it is this idea of bringing all of your past with you and stepping out into the future in this in, in this way. And so there's a kind of integration. And for me, that is the healing practice. It is the integrating of things and trying to see them as whole things rather than as parts. Thank you. I was just thinking about cosmologies. So um, one of the ways in which uh, Maori culture 
um, verbalizes and articulates space is that we tell stories regarding before time, time, and before space, space, which we call te kore. And um, when I was growing up, it was translated, I guess, incorrectly as the void. <laughs> And um, as, as, uh, as consciousnesses have been able to understand and we've been also able to intersect languages and communication, um, the ideas around uh, this vast potentiality um, is what we as Māori people understand, that's what we come from. And the, that space, that deep open space, um, then evokes the, the, the energies of earth and sky and, and an embrace between them. Uh, we call the earth Papa Tuanuku or the earth mother and the sky is Ranginui or the sky father. And I know a lot of other um, in, native and indigenous cultures around the world have different conceptions of the, the, the sort of physical, non-physical universe in which we're existing within together. And so I really love uh, thinking about how re-seeing those spaces um, as quite potent spaces can, can help give new ideas about what, what builds into and from that world. I'll just offer this, this final thing. For me, when I'm thinking or reflecting on non-human relatives, I'm often thinking about my location, um, much of my work is rooted and embedded in the location and the imagined spaces that I um, think about as something that I can exist in. So oftentimes when I'm thinking about a, a mover who is um, a person of color, sometimes this idea of the possibility of flight, the possibility of flight of our bodies and the way that, the, our, that our art exists, sometimes it's not, it doesn't exist. Because when we think about our, our art, it is always rooted in our race instead of it being, or, or rooted in our, um, our ethnicity or our class, it's rooted in this other thing where our bodies cannot exist in this other way. So for me, location is very important for me because it, I don't only make movement or, or art about my location, but oftentimes my location is infiltrating everything that I'm doing. And that is this non-human kind of relative that is constantly throughout my movement. These imagined, space and the, imagined spaces that I would like to be in, but also I'm a space that I'm very familiar with. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much. Um, I want to encourage people, we're going to close because we have pressed upon our presenters and upon you for a little extra time. But if you have resources, please throw them in the chat. Um, the staff of the Price Institute is going to put in the, the Price Institute social media and the Price Institute email. So if you want to hear about our upcoming events, you can hear about those. I know this is an event I'm going to go back and watch again. I know some people were asking about specific strategies and I feel like all of our presenters gave us those strategies in their presentation sometimes explicitly and sometimes implicitly. And so, um, you know, I'm going to encourage you to, to watch the videos again to gain some more of that knowledge. I also want you to save the date for the 41st annual Marian Thompson Wright Lecture, which is going to happen on February 20th. 2020. And again, um, the Price Institute staff is going to drop some information about that into the chat. It's one of the oldest Black History Month lectures in the country, and it's a very significant event for the Price Institute and for Newark, New Jersey. So again, I want to thank all of our presenters. I also want to thank Claudia, Marine, Randy, the staff who put together the technology and the logistics for this event to happen. And I thank all of you for really sharing in the energy and the space of this event. I wish you healing and safety and joy.